I would just, let's make a start. It's fantastic to see so many people here for our alumni um, event this evening. And hopefully you're all enjoying the brand new space and you love it so much that you're all going to come back and study with us again so that you can experience it as a student because it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but more importantly, hopefully you're here this evening to enjoy a truly entertaining um, guest lecture from Michael Devine. I'm Debbie Corrigan and I am the uh, Acting Dean of the Faculty of Education and it is my privilege to welcome you all here this evening and also to welcome Michael. Uh, I'm feeling a little bit old and a little bit unloved at the moment though, I've got to say, because Michael is of course an ex-Monash student, did his dip, dip ed here in, am I allowed to say? <laughs> Very late, 1999. And, and I taught him and he doesn't remember. <laughs> but he does remember some other stuff, so I'll let him off the hook this evening, but anyway. Um, so it is great to have our alumni come back and share their wisdom with us. I am really looking forward to Michael's uh, talk this evening. And Michael, of course, is a very successful educator. He, uh, has be he was awarded um, the Commonwealth Bank Teacher uh, uh, Teaching Award a teaching fellowship for a year that gave him the opportunity to experience very different um, educational opportunities in Dubai and around the, the globe. And uh, part of the Commonwealth Bank um, teaching fellowship is also around the Schools Plus program. And so really, I think um, I'm really looking forward to hearing Michael because he is the current principal at Western Port Secondary College Another school that is dear to my heart as for about 30 years, Monash has actually um, done a teaching experience with the Year 7 students there where our dip eds used to pretend that they knew how to teach kids and they'd take them and try and teach them at summer's camp one day of the year. It was always very interesting. <coughs> So I think what I'm really looking forward to is also hearing Michael's very personal stories about the successes and, and it's really fantastic to hear the impact that um, quality education can have on children. And so without further ado, I have waffled enough. Michael Devine, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thanks, Debbie. I, I do remember you. I do remember a couple of my lectures because it was a great, a great time and it's fabulous to be in this space. I, I, I'm really, really impressed. It certainly wasn't like this when I was here last time in the Rotunda. Um, but I'm suggesting that we get one of these for Western Port. I think it would go down really well. The kids would love it. So um, I'll, I'll take back that idea. But um, I do have some really good memories of my time. Yeah, I know there is a couple of my lecturers that I do remember well in here tonight. So it's been really good. Obviously, the topic that um, I've been asked to talk about is um, how, to, um, how teachers and schools can effectively manage challenging behaviours. And I do want to talk about that. But just before I do, I just sort of I thought I would start by talking a little bit about the experience of the last 12 months and about being um, a Commonwealth Bank teaching fellow and a little bit about what that's about because the stuff that we talk about tonight around this space is really challenging. It is one of the, the most challenging parts of the job and that's what all the, the grads that I work um, that come into my school tell me it is. Um, and and it is, there is some negative connotation with that. Um, so I thought I'd start off just by sharing with you a couple of things about the last 12 months. And, and another thing that, uh, as we get into this talk, I'm going to talk about how I think the profession has um, suffered a little bit, has been eroded away in terms of the respect and in terms of the way the profession is viewed. But I think there's some really good news out there to share with you. So Schools Plus was, um, f uh, and some of you will recognise probably Eddie Wu, who's probably our most famous um, teaching fellow. Um, but Schools Plus was actually uh, formed out of the Gonski Review in um, the first time around uh, under the Gillard government. And uh, a recommendation 42 of David Gonski's was that um, that government needed to do more to support philanthropic and business to uh, helping and um, assisting schools. So Schools Plus was a charity formed. Um, and as it formed, part of David Gonski's vision and the vision of a couple of people on the board of that was they really wanted to raise the profile 
of education. They really want to celebrate the great work that educators do. And we do take a battering, particularly in the media and in various different ways around our profession and, you know, not this and not that, and et cetera. And then, um, so they really wanted to promote that and, and swing that pendulum back a bit. So they decided to join forces with the Commonwealth Bank and a series of quite high-profile um, business leaders, so David Gonski being one of them, um, Nick Fairfax, um, and, and about you know, five or six others got together and said, we'll, we'll, we'll put these awards on for the next 10 years and we can really celebrate um, teachers from across the nation, so it's a, a national um, uh, fellowship, bring them together, really celebrate the work they're doing. So it was fabulous. So we, we went to Sydney, we got these awards and we spent 12 months, we went to Dubai and did some study. So we went to um, uh, Singapore and studied that education system. We got 35,000 to do some work in our schools, 10,000 to do a... Um, to do some professional development. But essentially this was about saying, we just want to celebrate. You know, we, we celebrate our, our, um, our sporting heroes, we celebrate our celebrities, we celebrate our, our, um, our, our movie stars, we sort of celebrate our politicians, kind of. Um, so we really want to celebrate our teachers. They do a really important, important work. And that culminated with just recently, a couple of weeks ago, was the end of the fellowship and the new fellows were announced. But we were invited to be part of the Global Teacher Prize. Whoever knew that existed? I didn't. But this is basically exactly what we've talked about in this national framework on an international framework. So it's funded by the Varkey Foundation, and they put up a significantly larger prize, not 45000 but $1 million US dollars. And we were all um, part of the process um, for, the, for the Teacher Prize for that year as part of that. Went to Dubai. And you'll see Eddie Wu um, in the top ten there, and, and there was a couple of other of the fellows also. But again, the very clear message was they really want to celebrate um, um, teachers and the good work of educators around the globe. And they have invested all this money in trying to put on this kind of, you know, Oscar-esque themed um, event, and it's Hollywood meets Bollywood on steroids. There's people from this show um, called Suits. Some of you have probably heard of it. I never had, but some of the stars from that were there. There's Jennifer Hudson up there singing, and there's uh, Al Gore there, you know, all, all of this work. But the message that I'm giving you is not this fantastic experience, but that there is some real movement out there around saying we need to do more to celebrate the work that teachers do. And I think that's a really important message because it is about that pendulum swinging back. Um, and finally, we did do a, a conference in Dubai before the teaching award, and it was really interesting. And I just wanted to share, it was an amazing lineup of speakers, you know, Julia Gillard, uh, Tony Blair, Nicholas Sarkozy, he was arrested the next day, but don't worry about that. Um, uh, um, Jeffrey Canada, who founded the Harlem Children's Zone. I'd been to see that here. I was, and you can see it's quite intimate because we're just sort of talking to each other there. Um, all these high profile speakers talking about their time in education, and the theme of the conference was what does the world look like in, uh, for young people in 2030? And uh, it, it was interesting, but three things that I want to share with you around that. One was, and they talked about education in developing countries. And one of the things um, was really clear about that, we ignore education in developing countries at our own peril. So as developed nations, we need to do more about making sure that those uneducated masses are educated, not only that, but that they're well educated. So there was a real push around that because potentially we don't, there's, there's po uh, potential catastrophic outcomes. So that was really clear. And the second thing that it, it, these leaders didn't speak together, we heard them all separately and in different forums, but there was a really clear message that, that, that kept coming out no matter who was speaking. And it's a lot easier for these leaders to say these things when they're out of office and they don't, you know, they're not actually, their fingers aren't in the purse strings and all that stuff. So I talked about on and on about, you know, education is the most important thing we need to do for young people moving forward. No matter what the world's going to look like, no matter what 2030, no matter what the job changes are, the technology changes, everything, education is going to be front and centre as one of the most important things a young person will need is a good education. And they talked about it being quality education. So not just kids in education, which in those globally developed countries have done a lot of good work there, but there's no point in being in education if you're not getting a really good education. It's got to be quality education. So that was that message. And from all of them was consistently that moving forward, education in those developed countries needed to be accountable, measurable, creative, adaptive, flexible.
Right? There was a really clear message. No matter what happens, that is going to be the way forward. So that's a huge challenge for us as educators, but definitely um, a really clear message about how we have to move forward with that. And the final thing from from the, this conference that was really clear was, and this is a bit of the work that we did in um, Dubai as well, and looking at global education management systems, GEM schools, which are part of the Varki Foundation, and seeing some of these schools, there's a real need, uh, there was a real, a very clear message that quality educators from quality teacher education institutes like this one are in demand. And they're in demand nationally and locally, don't worry about that, I can tell you that for sure but they are in demand internationally. And, and there's this vision that educators are, is, education is this, this human endeavour, that we're not, you know, that, that going forward, we're going to need quality teachers and quality educators in all these schools all around the world. And that's going to be more and more and more and more of a focus. So there's not a lot of professions that we can say right now, oh, that's going to still, you know, still be jobs for you in the future and all that. And, 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 um, but certainly that... Quality educators from quality education training will be quality education, teacher education will be in demand. And I think that's a really good message. You know, I, I think that there is this shift happening, there is this shift back to really raising the profile of the profession and this real um, opportunity for those of you, you know, in the professional, coming into the profession. I know we've got a, a mixed, mixed group here. So I, I wanted to start with that really good news story nationally and globally of this experience and what it's meant. But moving on, the topic tonight um, is around uh, managing challenging behaviours. And I've got two questions. These are rhetoric questions, so I'm going to answer them for you. Uh, is there an imperative, is, it a, is this an imperative component of our work as educators? Uh, I'm going to say, yes, it is. Uh, I think that to, to, you, to be an effective teacher, you need to have effective classroom management. You can have the best pedagogy, the best knowledge, all of that could be terrific, but you need to be able to effectively manage the classrooms. So that, that part's really important. The second part of this, though, is I'm going to present to you or put to you as part of this talk is that for effective classroom, for effective um, management of challenging behaviour to occur or effective classroom management to occur, you need to have effective relationships with students. That's my underlying premise that we'll talk more and more about, about the relationships you're building with students is what leads you to being effective um, classroom managers, effective teachers and being able to manage effectively classroom um, behaviour. And if you don't have those effective relationships with students, not only are you not able to control the class and be that effective teacher, but deep learning does not occur. Right? So that's, that's my premise, that deep learning occurs when there's effective relationship between the educator and the child. So it's a kind of chicken and the egg. We want, it, we want deep learning, we want to be effective teachers, we've got to have effective classroom management, therefore, and we've got to have um, effective relationships with our students. So that's the first part of that. And the second part of that is when and why did this occur in terms of when did it become such an imperative part of the job to be able to manage student behaviour, to be able to deal with and manage challenging behaviour? Has it always been like that? And of course, because I had Rosalie as a lecturer when I was here, historically I wanted to really consider that issue. You know, um, when did it change? Was it really like this, you know, 60 years ago? So I found a little bit of footage and I'll show you this and um, you can see what you think. This comes from a, it's actually from a, probably one of the first videos that went with the teacher training manual. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not, so they're actually talking about Funnily enough, building effective relationships is kind of the premise of this. But I've cut it really short just to catch a couple of little grabs of what's happening in the classroom about, um, ab about challenging behaviour. So I'll put this on. The vast majority of behaviour problems in the classroom involve minor breaches of discipline. These incidents frequently originate in the classroom situation itself and are within the control of the teacher. Disciplinary problems in the classroom are symptoms of underlying weaknesses in total learning situations. Mr. Grimes, mathematics teacher, is displeased with the progress of his ninth grade class in mathematics. Don't you realize that mathematics is an important subject? 
I tell you right now that unless you get over your lazy habit and come up to the standards I've set for this class, many of you will have the pleasure of repeating this course next semester. Well, what is it? Announcement, Dr. Williams. I have to leave for a few minutes. Now I want you to open your books and work out correct solutions of the problems you missed. The trouble is, you don't know what the word study means. You haven't the slightest idea. Oh, I tried. What kind of behavior do you call this? Wait a minute, you stay where you are. This is the kind of behavior I might have expected of you. All I do is leave the room for a few minutes, and what do I find? Confusion, disorder. And you, what were you doing? I was just going... Going to what? Throw the eraser, I suppose. It's a good thing I caught you. I'll make an example out of you. But I... That's enough out of you. Leave this room and report to the principal's office immediately. Well, hurry up. Don't take all day. <laughs> Who did that? All right, since you think it's so funny, the whole class can stay in for 45 minutes this afternoon. Then you'll see how funny it is. Remember, the whole class is to report back here at 4 o'clock. Where were we? So that's Mr. Grimes with his 1950 classroom management. So my question to you is, is that different? Why is that different? What, what do you notice is different about what you see today in the classroom? Anyone want to throw that at me? This is the only bit I'm going to do where I open it up to the floor, so don't worry. It won't happen again. Yep. True. That is definitely. Technology's not there. Yeah, true. Anything else? So what I find really interesting in this is that there's definitely some classroom management issue going on. There's you know, some challenging behaviour going on. But what's different is the way the teacher is able to deal with it because he just says, well, don't do it, and they stop. And the behaviour that's coming out is, is behind the teacher's back. So they start throwing things when he's at the board. Well, today, in a lot of the classrooms that I work in, I walk in there and the kids are doing that right in front of the teacher. They don't worry if I'm going to turn his back. You know, that's, uh, so it's in your face, it's blatantly I'm doing it wrong. And then the next point is, okay, so yeah, there's some challenging behaviours. He deals with it straight away, you know, he says, well, you know, stop talking, they stop talking. All right? And then he says, oh, okay, well, you, you can, go, you can go to the principal's office. And the kid picks up his books and goes out to the principal's office. When does that happen? That does not happen in my school, because first there's an argument about why he should have to go to the principal's office. It's not fair. He didn't throw the rubber. And if he's going to the principal's office, why isn't the other kid going to the principal's office? So you've got all of this different, and different approach. And of course, then he's able to do this chalk and talk and just say, we'll sit there, shove, and we'll all be back at 4 o'clock, and we'll do some extra work then. Well, that, that doesn't happen. But, but one of the key things that I'm suggesting to you is there is a different level of respect. All right, and that's what I think has eaten away at our system and has eaten away at our profession, is that that respect has changed. And it's, it is still there, and even though there is challenging, but there's respect for what the teacher says and there's respect to do what the teacher's saying. And I think that's our, fundamentally our, our really big differences about, about how the profession is viewed that way. And it doesn't just happen with the, the classroom management stuff. It's happening in a whole lot of other ways. And this cartoon's had various iterations. But, you know, it's the same premise of, you, got, you know, in the past, you got in trouble at school, you went home, you got in trouble at home, right? I spend so much of my time dealing with parents that come in and want to argue that, yeah, they know the kid did the wrong thing, they just don't want him to get the punishment, you know? So there's no consequence, or they're trying to battle and shift away from that. And again, this one, which is a classic change in the role, you know, we don't just respect what the teacher says, we demand that they change what they do. We're not just going to accept that the teacher is educated, knows how to educate, and that somehow it's the child's fault. This is what we're going to demand. So, so all of that has changed, and I think that that has bred um, a, more, a much higher increase in behaviours that really challenge, and it's become such an important part of the role. This picture here is of the first high school I taught at, and it's obviously abundantly clear to everyone in the room that clearly I was not there when the picture was taken because I'm way too young for that. But this is uh, 
Karam High School, and Karam High School's just opened. It's, this is about 1970. I wasn't even born then. Um, about 1970, and when I first went to Karam High, so you know, around Frankston, Karam, Bomb Beach, it then became Seaford Karam High School, and then I went to teach there when it became Patterson River Secondary College. And um, somebody showed me this photo of the school, taken 1970, just after it opened, and it really struck a note with me. And I'll tell you why at the time, and still does a bit, um, it, it really s struck a chord with me. I look at that photo and I see these um, you know, girls with their hats, everyone's really respectful, sitting well, ties, top buttons, suits. I think they look like a really respectable group of young people. And I'm thinking, this is so different to the experience I'm having at Patterson River, OK? So different. What has happened? What's changed? Because I see this so different to what I'm experiencing. So I'm, this is my first year. I've come out of Monash. I'm down there at Patterson River, for an example, around uh, as an example of what I mean. And um, I'm teaching 8J. They're a challenging group. And I'm teaching them SOS, as we used to call it, Studies of Society and Environment. Well prepared by Libby, of course. Libby Tudball, who's here tonight. I remember her well. And um, I'm going down to teach in... And at the time, the school's really ballooning. So we've got lots of kids coming in, 300 in a year level. Um, and I'm a grad teacher, and it's, you know, term one, term two, and I'm teaching 8J, and I'm teaching down in what the teachers refer to as the deep, dark depths of the school. So right at the back of the school, relocatable classrooms galore, State government just keeps plonking the classrooms on because parents have the right to choose where the child goes. So like R1, R2, relocatable one, R1, R2. Right? So I'm probably in R33, you know, you leave the, the school at the start of the day, take a packed lunch because you don't know when you'll be back. You get all the crappy classrooms when you're a grad. And um, so I'm down there doing 8J and we're doing so, so they've been a really challenging group, but I've been really working on what I'm teaching them and some classroom management strategies to, to bring them on board. And the class is going really well. I think this is... This is going really good, you know. I'm, I'm, I think I'm doing some good stuff. The kids are behaving pretty well, and we're, we're moving forward. So that's great. So I, I so we're just going to do some. Um, I'm going to put some notes on on the board. You know, we've had a really good lesson so far. Copy this down. So I start writing the notes on the board. Um, writing up there, and I can a little bit of chitter chatter going on in the, in the background. I'm thinking this is going really quite well. I think. Um, I've got these kids, I think I've turned the corner with them, they're behaving, they're engaged with the work, they're doing the lesson, I, I think we're really starting to move forward. So I'm up the front writing on the board, I'm doing a little bit of self-congratulatory back-slapping, thinking how well things are going, and then there is a commotion and I spin around, and there's Sean Brecken, down the back of the room, crouched on top of the desk, and he starts bobbing up and down, scratching under his armpits, making ape-like noises and pretending to be a monkey. And I've spun around and I've seen this. And twice in my career I've done this. I thought to myself, what the hell am I doing here? I mean, seriously, I've worked my ass off to get this class right. I've been working really hard to get this really engaging lesson. And I'm thinking that things are going so well. I'm slapping myself on the back. I'm turning around. I've got a kid up there on the desk pretending to be a monkey. We're not even doing anything to do with animals, you know? And so I think when I see this, I think, how did it go from that to this? You know, what happened? What happened? What changed? I don't know. And, you know, look, I... I I sorted it out with Sean, we moved on, um, I got used to it so much so that a few months later when Matt Hawkes was down on the ground, um, rolling around on his back, barking and pretending to be a dog, did not worry me at all in the slightest. But I was always struck about how we had changed so much, and I don't know exactly what the answer is, but I, my premise is there's been a real shift in the way the profession's respected, and kids are more and more challenging, and that has therefore become such an important part of it. But Sean taught me a lot, and one of the things Sean, I, I learnt about Sean and I began to understand was that Sean came from this incredibly disadvantaged and traumatised background. And one of the things that I had to get used to doing really quickly in that school, and also um, in my current school, was dealing with kids from disadvantage and trauma. And I want to talk about that for a few minutes and split off a little bit from the general classroom management stuff to talk about the disadvantage and trauma piece. And I, I would suggest that disadvantage and trauma exist in most schools, if not all. Um, perhaps some of the non-government elite private schools, there's maybe certainly not the disadvantage component. But in most government schools, you're going to have an element of disadvantage tra and trauma within that cohort. Um, and you need to know how to, how to learn how to deal with that. And depending on what school that is, if it's one of the schools I've taught at, you get a much higher proportion of that within, within um, 
within the cohort. So I'll talk about that and then we'll talk about the general classroom management stuff. And a lot of the, the, the way that um, trauma and disadvantage um, displays itself is just similar to that general classroom management stuff. But knowing the school's community and context is a key part of what you need to do if you're going to deal with disadvantage and trauma really effectively. All right, you've got to have an understanding of this. So I'm going to use my current school as an example, located in Hastings on the Mornington Peninsula. Western Port Secondary College, Mornington Peninsula, often known as Playground of the Rich and Fabulous, Clifftop Mansions in Portsea. This is the other end of that spectrum. Um, we're in a pocket of quite distinct disadvantage. Um, and what you need to do, and I'm suggesting you, is really to understand that because you're coming from very, you may come from a very similar environment. I don't know. But um, certainly that a lot of teachers come into the system and they come from quite different backgrounds to the one that these students are in. So it's about understanding you know, the, the context and the community and, and um, what does that mean. So some examples of, of the, the data that we would be talking about, we work across, um, across these four geographic areas, most of them are from Hastings. But let's look at that. Okay, so um, we've got percentage of sole parent families, you know, quite a bit higher in Hastings, 25%. Median weekly income, 844. Percentage of households learning less than 600 gross per week, 35% in Hastings. So that's really significant because if you're saying, well, to a student, oh, you know, I'm expecting this. If they're saying, well, uh, you know, 600 bucks, let's think about that I've got to pay for the car, I've got to pay for the rent for the house, I've got to pay for the utilities. When a kid comes and says we've got no money at home, the chances are they really have no money. So there is, there is this, this sort of theme coming out. And you can see that there's a real jump when it comes to Hastings and we're, we're miles off the board when it comes to um, the national average. And then what does that look like in that community, right? So Hastings has got a pocket of quite disadvantage in a, in a sort of a sub-community there, which was um, a lot of social housing, a um, bit of an experiment that I would say went really badly in the 1970s. And there's been a shift over time of a, a working class community to a well-being and welfare oriented community. But with all that uh, challenge in the community comes other things, like, for example, um, you know, uh, high, high rates of call-outs for domestic violence. A lot of the time we talk about the pines as a, pocket, a hot spot of disadvantage, but you can see there it's 33% high. So we're talking lots of domestic violence, sexual abuse, those sorts of things, that sort of trauma, um, mental health issues, welfare dependence. So, um, uh, uh, welfare dependence, low uh, which leads then that, that um, generational poverty, generational disadvantage, um, and, uh, then into, and then that all translates to lower education levels amongst the population as a standard and a value and low aspiration for careers and employment. So we're starting to paint a picture of, wow, this is some real issues happening in the community of this school and that's going to translate into what, what you're going to see. What is the impact that's going to be? Um, and just as a final point, this one here just looks, uh, I won't go into it too much, but basically what it's saying is um, we've got um, 2,581 kids aged between 10 and 19. Now, all, albeit some of those will be, um, uh, have gone to post-destination, um, which is, which is probably some positive one, and some of them are primary kids. But at 840, what that tells us is there's a lot of kids that should be in secondary school that aren't there. So you're creating this, this whole environment of, of there's a lot of trauma, there's a lot of disadvantage. So how does that enter into the school that you're going to be there as an educator at? Um, one of the biggest challenging behaviours, and we, we, we immediately think challenging behaviour is about you know, being naughty or, or all those things. One of the biggest challenges are around attendance and retention. It's really challenging behaviour when a kid doesn't go to school to educate them. In fact, it's more challenging than when they are there and they're, um, they're, they're misbehaving, you know, because you're not getting anywhere with them. So those sorts of things um, are a real issue, um, and, and that has been a real issue for us. We've had some significant improvements in that data, and we'll talk later about, you know, what some of those things have been. Uh, late, no equipment, no lunch, no uniform, diverse priorities. All right? and we see it all the time, particularly kids from really disadvantaged backgrounds, really traumatic backgrounds. They have made it to school. You should be grateful. 
is their opinion, right? So I have got to school. I have overcome all these hurdles. I have had a terrible night. Dad's been pissed. There's been domestic violence and all that stuff. But I have gotten to school. Don't expect me to do work and be in class and do the right thing and behave because I am here. So you get this sense of, um, okay, that, that's my priority is just to come in and do that, but I'm here. Diverse priorities around, okay, I don't have uniform. I, I might have a mobile phone. That's very important. I can look after that. Um, but some real challenges are, are around that. And, of course, then there's the no lunch, no food, et cetera, because we've come from really poor backgrounds. But that's a challenge for you because you're going to be the one that's trying to deal with that in the classroom. Lack of in interest, motivation... Um, a distraction, of course, because how do you concentrate on the work you're supposed to be doing when you've come from that environment? That's a really big challenge. Substance abuse, so we see that a little bit. Um, certainly cannabis abuse. I, I don't think um, pretty much the students that are, have um, substance abuse stronger than cannabis or more illicit than cannabis, they're pretty much not attending school. All right? So they're not going to be in your classroom on ice. That doesn't happen. Um, they might come to the school when they're... Uh, you know, not at school that day and cause some issues and we get a bit of stuff with that. But certainly um, some of them, you know, the parents are dealers and they're quite exposed to that so they don't think anything of having a brekkie bong on the way to school. An issue when they get there and they're influenced by that and we have to take action ar around that. Um, learnt behaviours, so again, just the thing, this is what I see at home, this is the way mum and dad deal with these issues and it could be, you know, um, abusive or violent or whatever it might be. Uh, Disproportionate reaction to an event. You know, Tommy, can you put the pen down? What the hell are you asking me to put the pen down for? Why don't you ask him to put the pen down? I didn't put the pen down. All this storming out of the room, you know, it's all over. Why don't you ask you to put the pen down? You know, so disproportionate reaction to anything because that can be triggered because we're, we're um, highly stressed. Uh, aggression and verbal abuse. Um, violence sometimes. I don't want people to think that there's a look different experiences in different schools and all that stuff, but I certainly have not come across um, violence between, uh, from a student to a teacher. Very rare, and if it has occurred, it's been a really minor thing. So, but certainly sometimes violence is a way of responding to something or responding to each other. We know there's a bit of that happening in the school. And the, the classic flip out, you know, completely lost it, throws the desk over, chucks the chair down, walks out, everyone's being abused, yelling verbal abuse and um, slamming the door and possibly walking off site, you know. So that, that sort of stuff can happen because this is the trauma and disadvantage and this is what it's bringing. So what do you do about it? Um, you need to accommodate as much as you can. A lot of the examples I have given you there are things that you're not going to be dealing with in the classroom because the kid's having a flip out and all that stuff they're going to be dealt with outside of the school, you know, year, year level coordinators or with um, principals or, or whatever. Um, if there's substance abuse, you know, you're referring that on. But it is about an awareness of how you accommodate that and how you interact with kids because one of the things when we talk about building those positive relationships and those effective relationships is that you need to be aware about what that kid might be bringing from home and, and accommodating that in the way that you engage and interact with them. Let me give you some examples. So, um, for an example, uh, a student... Uh, I mean, these are some examples that I've seen of teachers do. Um, Timmy abuses some kid in the yard, you know, you're an F and this and, you know, well, C word and the whole, the whole bit. And the teacher says, Timmy, that's not... You know, that's, that's disgusting, inappropriate language. Um, what would your grandmother say if she heard you say that? And he looks quite blankly at the teacher. Well, she uses that language all the time. All right, so first thing is you pass judgment on the fact that that's the way his grandmother should behave, but he also takes away from that. He's really offended because you've kind of insulted his nan. He doesn't really know why, but he doesn't like you as a teacher and you're going to be struggling to build an effective relationship with it because that is kind of considered an insult. They will pick very quickly if they think you're belittling them or, or um, you know... Um, a superior in some way to them. Another example, um, you know, Johnny, have you got your money for the excursion on Friday? No, we can't afford it, but it's only five bucks. But if Johnny's stealing food because he's starving, then five bucks is five bucks, and you're passing judgment then by saying, you know, um, five bucks is this. Again, challenging to build an, an effective relationship with that kid. Kid comes in late to school. Why are you late? Slept in, use an alarm clock, I don't have one. Well, surely someone in the house has got an alarm clock. Well, actually, no. 
No one in the house has got an alarm clock. And as a disadvantaged community, we live in a perpetual state of darkness. The only way we know the time is by turning the TV on. So, so they're the sort of things that we're saying that, you know, particularly in that classroom teacher level, as it escalates up, there's more things that can be done at the school-wide level and the system level. But the classroom teacher level, it's, it's, it's an awareness about that. When you're doing the, the careers talk or talking about their futures, you know, don't say things like, oh, you don't want to be a dull bludger all your life, you know, because quite likely you've just insulted aunt, uncle, mum, dad, granny and grandpa. You know, they've all been unemployed that whole time. So really careful around those sort of things because, because you can't build effective relationships if, you're gonna, if they're going to perceive that you... Uh, that you think you're superior to them. So it's about being aware of that background and what they're bringing and thinking about that and not just assuming that everyone's had the same sort of, you know, a positive um, existence and that some of them have come from really, really traumatic experiences. Um, but talking more about just that general classroom management stuff, that challenging behaviour stuff, and I put in there in red three times, relationships, 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 because it's really important to build those effective relationships. How do you do that? How do you get to a point where you can start having those effective relationships? So here are some strategies that I'm going to... Uh, share with you that I hope will be useful. Uh, firstly, uh, knowing and implementing the school policy, so whatever that might be. Now, um, for us, we do school-wide positive behaviours, um, which we've done some work with Umesh around that. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the schools that you go to or schools that you're in, they will have some policy around that. It is really important you know that. And, of course, you've got your tool back from, toolbox from what you've been taught in your uh, teacher education training, if your teacher education is that you've got that toolbox of strategies that you're going to be using. So you've got those things and you know what that policy is. The second thing is, of course, you start up your classroom with those expectations about how kids are going to behave and, and you collaborate with them and you work on that, but you have clearly identified the three or four things that you want to be in the agreed norms and expectations, and you make sure that, that comes out in, in your discussion and in your collaboration with students. It's really easy to do, it's just a bit of manipulation and we do it all the time. So um, making sure, yes, they can have a say, but ultimately it's about getting to a point where effective learning can occur and you can build those effective relationships. Mentor pointed out, Pretty much every school, I guess some schools you might go and you don't get a mentor. Most schools should be giving you a mentor. If you're not getting one, ask for it. But talk to the mentor because I often find that uh, te new teachers, graduate teachers coming to the program are reluctant to have that discussion about the challenging behaviour because they see it as a sign of failure or they see it as a sign of not coping. Not right. You need to be having those discussions with your mentor. Um, discuss, talk and collaborate and seek good advice from within especially from prior teachers. If you're not teaching prep in year seven, the likelihood is the class you're teaching has been taught by somebody else in the school in the past. So you, you work out, identify who that might be, who would be a good teacher in the school to talk to, someone that has done some really good stuff, so you can go and you can say, look, I'm having a problem with 8J, the kid's getting up on the desk pretending to be a monkey all the time. And he goes, oh, I had that problem with 7J when I took them last year and here's some of the strategies that really worked. And the grads in my school tell me that's one of the key things that has helped them overcome this, this issue is around how they've been able to collaborate and work with other teachers and get ideas from them. So it's really important that you, you, you're seeking that out and you're having that discussion and don't be afraid to have it and don't be reluctant to have it. Taking a genuine interest, building a rapport with kids. Kids will know if you're giving them lip service or if you're genuinely interested in wanting to do them. And I guess that's something you, know, you can't make happen. You either have that interest or you don't. Um, but it's about trying to engage with them about the things also that really interest them and knowing them, um, knowing um, them outside of class. And there's lots of ways in schools to do that because you can be taking, taking the sporting group or being involved in the drama or the production. So you get to see those kids outside of the classroom. You're not focused on the classroom, the content you're supposed to be teaching them, but you're able to engage with them around different things and particularly things that they like. I remember when I was teaching Year 7, um, and again, it was a challenging class, and one of the things they loved was they loved food technology. We used to call it food technology. And they loved food technology, and they'd go in there and they'd do a double. Well, I found that I wasn't teaching that double, so what I did, I went and did the class with them. Not as an extra teacher, just as a peer. I learned how to cook. It was great. We engaged with each other, and I was learning with them around the cooking. But they loved it, and it gave me that opportunity to then start building those effective relationships with those kids outside of the context of teaching that then 
then, that then strengthens that. So looking for those opportunities um, around, and as I said, you know, um, volunteering to be part of these extra things that you know kids that are going to do and they're going to love and being a part of that. Engage with the family if that's an option. Real challenge in our point, but of course, if you can have a positive relationship with the family, the students that you're teaching, that helps you build an effective relationship with them. It also gives you some buy-in and some idea about their background and what their likes and interests might be. So that's another uh, key way that you can, you can get some buy-in to building that effective relationship. Target key players. When you go into the classroom and you're saying, OK, I, I want to build, I, I want you, I'd be saying, I want you to build relationships with every kid in that class. But the first thing you're going to do is not build a relationship with Tommy who sits up the front, who's really good, who does his work all the time, easiest kid to build a relationship with. Forget about him for a minute, come back to him later. Pick um, Steve-O, who's kind of the cool, you know, I'm, I'm really good, everyone listens to me, I've got a lot of influence. Start by building your relationship with him because if you get a couple of those key players on the side, the others will follow suit. So be, be mindful of that, saying, I'm investing my time in him, 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 her, 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 because that's going to, once I've got those relationships, that will help me then have that more effective classroom management and build more effective relationships. Never presume a little bit about what I was talking about before. If you're going to have a discussion, or for example, from my point, view with a student, I always start the question, uh, who do you live with? Um, because you never really know. Don't presume that um, they've come from a you know, traditional family background. It can be all sorts of things in that answer. Um, be friendly, polite and respectful. So I've got a school review coming up and uh, it's actually a lecturer from Monash. She's not here tonight. So I can say this, but I have been going around talking to students and doing our self-evaluation. Um, and our review. And one of the things I've talked to kids about in the different um, year levels as they come in, I said, what motivates you to work really effectively in a classroom? And a number of them have said, we do that if we like the teacher. I said, well, what, what makes the difference between whether you like a teacher or not? Well, we like them if they don't yell at us, fair enough, and we like them when they're really, you know, polite and, and, and friendly and nice to us. And it's really interesting, because, you, know, you know, I see... Um, I don't think teachers go in there as derogatory and rude or anything like that in my school, but it's a really stressful job. You're often under the pump, you're rushing from classroom to classroom, and it's pretty easy to lose that focus of being just really friendly, really pleasant and really engaging with the kids. And they pick up on that. And, look, it's not a challenge, but I do know teachers in my school who have done this for a long time, and, you know, a kid comes in, mate, so glad to see you, so glad you're here, come in, take a seat and have that really friendly, positive interaction are the ones that don't have the classroom management issues, OK? But it is something you have to be aware of because it's, it's easy to lose sight on that in the busyness of schools. But be their teacher, not their buddy. You have this unique opportunity as the teacher. You are partly the parent, partly the friend, partly the, the, partly the, uh, the educator. All these different roles combined into one don't lose sight of the fact that at the end of the day, you are the teacher and you're not just the buddy and you're not just the friend. And I see that fairly regularly with young people coming, young teachers coming into the system, that they're, 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 they're crossing those boundaries. So you've got to get that balance right. Um, be consistent and transparent, firm but fair, clear boundaries. They will sniff that they think there's some injustice going on and you will hear about it and they will not let go of that. So it is really important that um, it's really consistent, it's really the same, it's, it's really transparent and it's, and it's fair but firm um, and that everyone knows where they stand. And that comes back to the classroom nor norms and the rules and expectations. You've all agreed on that. So it's a thing you're coming back to. And you've got to you know, watch yourself that you're not sort of um, perhaps being, you know, Easier on some kids and harder on others, probably the ones that are more challenging. So just making sure you've got that even balance all the time because they will pick up on that. Remember it's an autocracy, so you get a lot of bush lawyers in secondary schools um, in the classroom. Um, at the end of the day, they'll talk about their, you know, it's my right and I'm allowed to sit here because I should be allowed to sit where I want, all this stuff, right? At the end of the day, yeah, there are some rights, you know, in terms of you're entitled to come here and be educated and be safe. But the classroom is an autocracy and you're the teacher and you're in charge. And, and don't get sucked into the whole thing about it's a democracy. It's not. 
you know, it's a teacher student, and this is there. There is some expectations that they can argue that they need, and that's fine. But it is an autocracy. Critically, and my last point about this, about the teacher role, is to uh, be prepared, engaging, rigorous, thorough, active. You can't complain about student behaviour if you've gone in there with a half-baked lesson and you're not thoroughly prepared. Okay. If you've gone in, you've got the engaging lesson, you've really worked hard and, and you've um, really mapped out what's going to be and it's rigorous and it's moving and you know, it's not just chalk and talk, then if they're misbehaving, sure, you've, you've, got, you've got a case, you know, complain away and, and we'll do something about it. But you've got to make sure that every lesson, it's a challenge, you know, it's a lot of work, but every lesson needs to be really thorough and um, rigorous and engaging. And that is primarily one of the best ways to manage your classroom management issues because if those kids are really engaged in what they're doing and, you know, give you countless examples about the kids that, um, that when, when they are engaged and when they, they do feel like they're learning, that they will be really well behaved because they'll be really engaged with what they're doing and that gets rid of a whole lot of the angst. So just uh, to talk a little bit about school level response to challenging behaviours. So this slide up here is um, of um, SWPBS, School Wide Positive Behaviours. But I've seen iterations of, of this um, uh, many, many times coming from the department. And basically it's working on the premise that we've got all kids, you know, some kids, few kids. Um, and pretty much that's, that's the way a lot of the um, um, behaviour the behaviour policies are set up, that we have policies in place that deal with all kids, you know, around uh, expectations, around the way we behave and the way, the way they're treated. Then we have some programs and some things we do for some kids, and then we have our um, top tier kids, those really challenging behaviours that have more, more strategies and more interventions. And if you like, there's, you know, all kids are vulnerable, all kids have some, you know, need some sort of classroom management, they're sitting in the green and you move up. And depending on what school you're in, you might have a lot of kids sitting in the, those top two, you might have a few kids, but every school will have some of those kids in each of those brackets. So what do we do? Um, what's our response? And this is something that you, uh, if you go, as you go into those schools, um, you're not necessarily controlling this. The school may have it, the may, may not. Um, but certainly you're aware of and you're able to influence or be a part of or suggest about what some of these programs might look like. So these are all the programs in my school that we run um, around uh, supporting, is the school approach, you know, that school level approach to managing challenging behaviours. So school-wide positive behaviours, we have this program called CLASS. We have hands-on learning where kids are taken out of the school for a day a week and, and work with their hands. And we have an outreach program, which is partly about addressing, addressing those kids that aren't in school, that are, that are missing. Um, and uh, we have some teachers that go out and just work with them for about half an hour a week, um, kids that otherwise should be in school. School-based apprenticeships and traineeships, they're pretty much for older kids, structured workplace learning. But these are opportunities and interventions that we can put in place, with particularly some of those kids that are sitting in the yellow and red zones in that, in that spot. Rock and Water, which is about working with kids on managing their behaviour. Girls Group, Breakfast Club, Lunch Club, you know, different music and drama programs are different outlets for kids to, um, to engage in. Meditation and mindfulness through our library art therapy, martial arts therapy. So different ways in which the school says, OK, look, we've got a lot of kids with some really challenging behaviours. What can we do about it? And these, you know, is a snapshot of all the things that we do. As I said, you may go into schools, they may be doing some of these, they may be doing none of these. Perhaps, as, as you know, if you're a grad going in there, there's an opportunity for you then to leverage that uh, with the school leadership, or certainly as you move up in, in, in the school, that you could be looking at some of these things as, as ways to tackle that and support that, uh, that management of that challenging behaviour. And finally, challenging, uh, responding to challenging behaviours from the system level. Uh, so I'm talking about the department and the government in my case. Um, so we do have some teaching units. Don't hold your breaths with teaching units. This is where they take students out of class for a term at a time and do some intensive work with them to um, improve their behaviour so that they can reintegrate into mainstream schooling. There are not many of them. I don't think there's a big... Um, 
uh, push from the department to create anymore. Um, they are seen as a last resort. They take very few kids. So don't think, oh, I'm having some real troubles with kid in year eight. I might suggest you go to the teaching unit. It won't happen. Um, but it is one way the department does try and support this. Um, so there's different, uh, different iterations of that. There's, you know, my unit farm, Caulfield Community School and Pavilion. So these are some of the things that the department does. So I will we'll support this program as a way of addressing um, some of that need. Flexible learning options, so um, these are different systems, again, particularly for older kids, but there are a few of those about. Um, Navigator, which is a program that um, students that should be in school, that aren't in school, can be referred to to try and get them back into school. So this is the challenging behaviour that comes with non-attendance or non-retention. The department's way around doing that is is setting up these programs to try and support kids to shift back into school. Um, we have the Lookout, so that's another program the department runs about identifying kids at risk of dropping out and trying to support them to stay in school. Uh, community providers, and again, this is more just some alternative arrangements that come up um, and the department support around completing a senior secondary program in a community um, provider rather than a mainstream school. But just not lose sight of that with all that challenging behaviour stuff, the department's view, and my view too, is that the best place for a young person to be for education is in a mainstream school. So these sort of things are the last level resort, but to be fair, this is something that the system does to try and support um, uh, schools who have students with challenging behaviours. Um, and obviously there's TAFE and then there's vocational education and training as kids move up through the system. Uh, and community VCAL. All right, so really, in a nutshell, I guess that, that is the kind of things that we would address at teacher level, school level, system level around supporting and, and managing challenging behaviours that are, for whatever reason, a really um, big part of the job. Um, it may be daunting, but I, the message that I'll give you from, from the grads that I talk to, and in my own experience as well, you just have to get in and do this part, and it is challenging, and it is um, difficult as you start in this environment. Um, but once you have moved through this and you have you know, picked out those kids and built those relationships and started to have that effective relationship, this all becomes second nature. All right? and it really does change. And you sometimes think when you first start, is it always gonna be like this? It doesn't, and if you can um, master that effective relationship, master that, that classroom management, this all just blends away and it becomes just part of the job and becomes quite um, easy and quite familiar and quite used to. But we can only do so much at the end of the day. It's about going to that classroom on your own and doing this yourself and that, that is what makes the big difference. But uh, 12 months, I like to say, give it about a year and you'll find that the, that whole piece is no longer the big threat or the overwhelming thing that it once was. Um, and that's it. I'm happy to take any questions. I'll hand back to you, Debbie. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Michael. That's terrific. So we've probably got time for a couple of questions. So, ah, so... You'll get the microphone in just a minute. Hi. Um, look, I just wanted to know, what's your opinion of giving teachers information about kids' trauma, background, etc.? Some of the schools I've been in give you lots, yeah. some give you nothing, and that makes it quite difficult. Yeah, so uh, that is a really contentious issue, particularly around all the privacy laws and, and things like that. My, my opinion is that um, if it's pertinent for you to know that, for you to do your job more effectively, then you should know that, um, unless there's some reason that there is some privacy around that. So I would say that um, my response to that would be, if, if this is going to make you be more effective in your job, then, then that should be shared with you. Because it is important, you know, you know, we're asking you to build really effective relationships with kids. You can't be, you know, hiding the truth about them. So if that can, if that can help you build a more effective relationship, it should be done. But it will come down, as you're alluding to, to different schools and, and the way the approach about that. But that would be my approach anyway. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Oh, Chantelle, must, you must have one online, do you? 
Okay, yeah, we've got um, Candy online who's asking, how would you build relationships with children if you work as a CRT teacher? Yeah, okay, so uh, CRT, that is really tricky because one of the things I've just talked about is that, you know, give it a year and, and, um, and uh, you've built those relationships and it makes the job so much easier. But I think you've got to come back to, and depending on how long you're in that school for as a CRT, but if you remember the start of what I said about the teacher stuff, about having the clear boundaries, setting those clear expectations, having an agreement about that, being firm and fair, being flexible, being transparent, that's got to be your starting point. Now, hopefully, um, you start with that, you get some buy-in that way, and then you're coming back to that school more and more regularly so that you can then move some of those relationships forward and actually start to build them. But, um, you know, obviously it's much more difficult in a CRT role to be really building the effective relationships. But come back to those, those clear, really consistent points, particularly at the beginning of that slide around these are the things that you need to be doing. You know, even the things like, OK, I'm here for a day, it's recess, I'm going to find out who took HA last, last year or, or, or what other strategy. So, again, using that network of teachers in the school, don't be afraid, go and ask them and have a discussion. Look, I'm taking, I took HA last week in this class, I'm having them again, have you got some suggestions for me or strategies that have worked? So you're trying to leverage some support that way as well as having that, that really clear expectation at the beginning. I think we've probably got time for about one more. Okay, yes. Good. I'm glad you've got a question because I had one, but yours will be better. <laughs> okay, um, so Michael, thanks for the talk there. No problem. So my question is really is about your uh, outreach program. Mm. Does that program actually allow the teachers the opportunity to tap into students where their parents have actually chosen to homeschool them? Uh, not not really. There's some changes around homeschooling in which school, which the departments, um, I'm not sure where they're up to with it, but that students should still be attached to a school even if they're being homeschooled, yeah. and they are doing some work around that. But the outreach program that uh, Western Port run, as well as McClellan Secondary College in Frankston, is around um, um, identifying students that or young people that are in no education, training, job or anywhere, right? And what happens in the system is that kids, sometimes when they move from primary to secondary or sometimes when they leave a secondary school, they're not traced, right? So they become, um, they become not attached to anything and they become these numbers of, of unknowns around um, not, not doing anything and uh, not, not being transitioned to another school. So while the outreach program is... Um, gets referrals often from um, criminal justice, from DHS, from Navigator, that Navigator program. And our aim is, you know, at the end of the day, the department gets really frustrated with saying, well, you know, what do we do? Because those kids are making a conscious decision not to go to school. They're not going to, you know, suddenly go, oh, well, we're going to come to school. So what the outreach program does is come and spend about, you know, one to two hours with them a week around trying to either, either get them back into school um, or around giving them some educational activities to do over that week and then trying to transition them into something else. So what we'd be saying is if you're being touched base with by a teacher at least once a week, even if it is only for an hour, it is better than nothing. And if we're going to make those inroads into the disastrous outcomes that come from non-school completion and expose, you know, try and put barriers around that, then that's what we really need to do. So it's not really attached to homeschooling, but it is attached to those kids that are just nowhere and are not being picked up and are not being targeted by anything. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So, Michael, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank you. I mean, it was fantastic to hear such a practical um, approach to the sort of differences that teachers can make. So I totally agree with you about let's go out there and raise the profile of teachers because it's such a powerful position in terms of what is possible. Yep, and I think you've brought that to life for us. And building those relationships, that's why many of us get into education to start with. Relationships are fundamentally important. And so it's also nice you've kept your relationship with Monash. That's right. <laughs> but I just, on behalf of you all, would you please thank Michael for his fantastic talk tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much.